this conference yeah, will now be recorded. And because we are uh, talking about the railway, I thought I'd start with a slide of the car, um, just to change things a little. Um, the car was actually chitty chitting bang bang. Um, it had a 23 litre aero engine and raced around Brooklyn at 108 miles an hour in the early 1920s. But that's not the important part of it. Um, the important thing is the driver. And the driver was Count Louis Zabrowski, uh, and he was one of the main movers behind the building of the railway. In fact, there were two people who uh, were into the um, key to the railway. Here it comes. Um, Count Louis Zabrowski is on the right hand side of the screen. And he was significantly wealthy. He'd married into the Astor family, and his wife's family owned about half of Manhattan. Um, he was therefore a young man of leisure and great means. Um, and he was friends with a gentleman on the left, uh, Captain J.P. Howey, um, who was also a man of independent means, but not quite so uh, affluent. Um, his family only owned, owned about half of Melbourne in Australia, hence the interesting hat. Uh, they both had an interest in steam railways, uh, and they had decided between them that they would like to make a 15-inch gauge railway. Um, and Zabrowski decided that uh, he would build a 15-inch gauge railway in the grounds of his house near Canterbury. However, he died in 1924 uh, in an, a crash at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza and therefore um, bequeathed the two locomotives he'd already ordered to uh, Captain Howie. So Howie, keen both to have a railway and to uh, honor the memory of his friend, uh, decided that he needed to go and work out how to, where, where to build a railway. Several sites were examined, but he engaged, uh, as we see on the next slide, uh, Sir uh, Henry, a chap called Henry Greenley to lead the design, building, and equipping of the railway. Now, in those days, things moved fairly quickly. Um, they identified the, um, the site in, in Kent as a good contingent because the route from New Romney to Hyde, which you can see on the left-hand side, had already obtained powers by the Southern Railway in 1884 to extend their railway from New Romney up to Hyde. If you look on the, the, the diagram, you'll see in a dotted line uh, the, the previous line from uh, the line to Dungeness up to New Romney, and that stayed uh, in operation until the beaching cuts. So it was a perfectly logical thing to do, to say, well, in order to serve New Romney to Hive, uh, we could build a smaller gauge railway because the southern region, the southern, southern railway, while it was still keen to expand, had decided there wasn't enough traffic to warrant that extension. So Henry Greenley went off to see Sir Herbert Walker and um, see whether he could negotiate a release of that, uh, that right to the Romney Hive and Dimchurch Railway. Um, they said yes. So uh, Captain Howey, not being a man given to uh, waiting patiently for things, uh, bought the land and started work on site. This created a little bit of consternation locally because, of course, they had neither a light railway order um, nor any other permission to build. But how he was a determined individual, um, and when asked at the inquiry uh, in January uh, 1926 uh, whether he, uh, he should be doing this, his response was along the lines of, well, it's my land, I shall do what I like with it. Um, so, in fact, there was very little objection to the, um, to the proposed railway because, bearing in mind, we are now in 1926. Um, there isn't much uh, public transport around. The local bus company objected, but most people didn't have access to a car or a horse. Um, and so the line being of local public, be public benefit was indeed um, a difficult one to argue against. So the issuing of a light, of light rail railway order was almost a formality. Uh, and then, excuse me, I just need to get the next slide to come up. Um, so in May 1926, the light railway order was granted. Uh, work had already started on site, and the line between New Romney and Hythe was opened in July of the following year. And just a year later, uh, the extension to Dungeness was open. So there was no doubt that you know, three years from uh, first meeting with the Southern Rail Railway to bringing the whole railway into service uh, is a timescale 
that few of us now could imagine happening um, in, uh, in such a brisk fashion. So the work had started. Uh, so Captain Harry, the gentleman in the hat, uh, took a keen personal interest in the development of the railway. And the gentleman with the flat hat is Henry Greenley, who being as the engineer for the line, did a great deal of the surveying and setting out. Um, however, it was obvious to begin with, and here we come to the engineering of it, that here we are they're digging out the trace and putting in the temporary way. And you can see that really, for uh, much of the line, uh, all that was done was to clear the vegetation off the top. We're here on, here on Romney Marsh, and the ground conditions are variable, to say the least. Uh, but there's, you'll see there's no mechanical plant, and the quality of the temporary way uh, tells you how, uh, how carefully they prepare the formation. However, they did have some mechanical aids. Here we have a shot that uh, they were going to spike the railway to its sleepers, and they actually had a hand drill, or a mechanical drill, for doing that. So they, they must have been extremely busy because it's a very, very long railway. It's eight miles from New Romney to Hythe and a further five and a half miles in the opposite direction to, to Dungeness. So there were a lot of sleepers to drill. When we look at track laying, it's not apparent how they actually did the work because the, the, uh, the uh, visual record uh, isn't consistent. Here we have a shot that appears to show quite clearly that the permanent way was laid with the sleepers and rails and the ballast we tipped later, because you can see the temporary way on the left-hand side. However, other photographs show that the, um, that the track laying uh, was laid in a way that would be more familiar to us, to lay the ballast first, and then the sleepers, and then the rail on top. The rail was war surplus, 25 pounds per yard, hence it wasn't that difficult for a small team of, uh, of, gang, of uh, navvies just to lift the rail in by hand. However, as the work progressed and things got better and more organized, uh, they could bring in a work train uh, to help finish off, in, that case, in this case, the fencing, uh, and made very, really, really very brisk and good progress. And despite the um, somewhat crude method to our eyes of producing railway, they did produce, as you can see here from the track work at uh, New Romney, pretty good standard of, uh, of permanent way uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the thing in the, for the pro project in concept. You can also see just vaguely in about half distance, they also put a scissors in at New Romney station. So it wasn't just a simple, simple up and down railway. It was a proper railway with proper points and access control to the station. There weren't many structures on the railway, still aren't, but this is one of particular note. Uh, this is Prince of Wales Bridge where the, uh, the road is carried over the railway. You can see they dug out a small cutting. And once again, a very large group of uh, workers on the railway, but a relatively, um, in fact, a complete absence of any sort of mechanical plant at all. And so it was, uh, it was certainly a labor of love. They also had, <clears throat> this on the Dungeness extension, uh, another significant structure, which is still in place today, is the road bridge at, uh, at New Romney. And uh, the water that's there then, in 1927, um, is still there now. Um, bear in mind we are on Romney Marsh, and the water level and groundwater level, uh, A is high, and B tends to vary with the tide. And we have a pump uh, mounted in that sump, uh, which is operating almost constantly to keep the railway formation dry. Um, so you could have wished, perhaps, that they'd allow them to have a level crossing over the main road, but unfortunately not. However, a lot of work was done, and a lot of it was done to a very high standard. Here we have an early shot of Hythe Station. You can see a small overall roof and a very neat and tidy looking uh, setup. However, fairly early on, they discovered that the cost of the railway was going to be a great deal more expensive, a great deal higher than they originally thought. So here we have an early shot of Dimchurch Station, which um, has a number of interesting features. Uh, in the middle distance, you can see an overall roof, which they felt was a good idea. Uh, in the immediate foreground, there is the footbridge designed by Henry Greenley. And in a bid to save cost, the gents urinals were placed in the uh, columns holding up the footbridge. Um, I can reassure PWI members that's not the situation nowadays. 
but it was a good way of saving cost. Also a way of saving cost, the building in towards the front, you should just be able to make out the fact it says booking office on the front. So they spent a great deal of time and effort building the railway, but essentially decided to provide a timber shed to sell tickets to the public. So uh, very much a lot of the railway had its corners cut a little bit towards the end. How he, how his specification to Greenley, we understand, was that the railway should last for Howie's lifetime. And of course, here we are a considerable time afterwards, uh, reaping the benefits of that decision regarding the quality of the infrastructure. However, while they were building the railway, the loco started arriving. Uh, this is locomotive number one at Bins Garage, New Romney. Please note the date, 1925. Uh, that was probably about the same time as Greenley headed off to the Southern Railway officers to speak to Sir Herbert Walker. Um, so how he thought, well, uh, I've, got, I've got two locomotives now bequeathed to me by Zabrowski, but that won't be enough. So in February uh, 1926, shortly after the, uh, when he knew that he'd be able to get the light railway order, he ordered a third uh, and fourth locomotive. Um, but then with ambitions to go to Dungeness, he decided that he would actually need some more locomotives and being a man of independent means, uh, ordered a, uh, a further suite. So uh, in 1926, uh, we have here a, a photograph of five locomotives in production at the same time at David Paxman's work, Paxman's work at Colchester. Um, this was to provide a more than adequate fleet of uh, engines for the traffic that he expected. Two of those locomotives uh, weren't built to the same design as the one you can see in the foreground because the county council, um, as part of the planning application, insisted the railway be able to carry freight. So two of the locomotives, as you'll see later, uh, were built to a, uh, the same basic design but to a different wheel arrangement. So there we are. We've uh, built a railway uh, from concept to delivery in three years flat, um, <coughs> and it was ready to go. Um, and that's, I suppose, that is the end of the, uh, the part of the presentation that deals with the construction of the railway. Uh, the next part, um, like all railways, we have learned from experience and have had to use our engineering knowledge and um, enterprise to move forward. The key thing for the Romney Highland Dinchurch Railway, actually, is its level crossings. Uh, it has 13 crossings for road traffic and 28 for farm traffic that in an overall length of 13 and a half miles. So you'll appreciate that managing that interface between the railway and its neighbors, either on public roads or on farm roads, uh, has been a significant issue. And that is the issue. Uh, this slide dates from 1935, when a lorry collided with a train uh, at, uh, at Dimchurch, that's number two lying on the side. Because un, I mean, collisions between uh, road traffic and um, railways are never a good thing. But with our railway particularly, uh, then the trains are not heavy enough um, and usually come, off, usually come off worse in any collision. So that was the, that's a problem that the railway had for many years with road traffic. Um, and a photograph from a, sim, a similar era also with farm traffic. Uh, because people just don't, farmers don't see the need to stop for the train, and our train usually comes off worst. So, as a result of that, where we are now, um, I beg your pardon, as a result of that, nothing much changed, and we had open crossings. You can see there on the left hand side of that shot how, how level crossings used to be signed a giveaway sign and a picture of a steam engine. And while that looks curious to us now, that was common practice in the 1950s, 60s, and even into the 70s. Um, open crossings weren't seen as being particularly dangerous. They were seen as being how railways cross roads, particularly in this case, they were quite a small railway. Um, however, uh, in 1973, the need to change became urgent. Um, that car was a Ford Corsair before it hit the train, and the driver survived. That's what happened to the loco. And sadly, the driver didn't survive. And that was the first crash that the railway had had where the driver had been uh, killed. And that really set everyone thinking about, well, okay, 
what should we do to improve the safety of our level crossings um, because collisions aren't acceptable. In the, in the end, where we have ended up is with that, something that looks like uh, a standard level crossing to road users. It's been done in two stages. In 1973, there was a program to put in uh, flashing light wigwags and crosses at the open crossings with signage. <clears throat> but sadly, we had two further collision, collisions in 2003 and 2005 in which the loco driver on both occasions sadly also died. So it became obvious that we needed to put something that looked like an ordinary barrier crossing, so automatic barriers controlled locally, um, on, our, on our crossings. And we risk assessed them um, so that we could work out which crossings to do first. And we then started the conversion to ABCL. This is our first ABCL conversion. And I'm not a signaling engineer, but I can assure you that that looks very much like a standard network rail crossing control cabin. It worked extremely well, but it presented a challenge to the railway, and the challenge to the railway was one of money. Uh, you can see a great long three lines of standard signaling relays. They cost, nowadays, an average of about £500 each. Varies up to £900 for the most expensive and 200 and something for the least expensive. But with 13 crossings to modernize, the whole cost of, there was a real risk that we wouldn't be able to afford to modernize all the crossings. And of course, once drivers start to expect the crossing to look like a particular um, presentation, um, on, in such a restricted area of the country, they'll expect every, con con every crossing to be like it. So um, we also had to work out, uh, we had, we've had in the early stages, conversion to track circuits so that the crossings could work in both directions because they did when they were um, in um, open crossings. We needed to maintain that facility. So that, that, was a, that was what we first did, whereas now this is what we now have done and all crossings have been converted. So there are still, um, as you can see at the top, seven industry standard signaling relays, but the rest of the control of the crossing is done by programmable logic controllers, which have to agree with one another to ensure the crossing is, state, is safe. That has significantly reduced part, it's part of the significant cost reductions we've been able to achieve while maintaining a very, very high level of safety. And the other changes that we have made is um, we did have track circuits, but as you can well imagine, on the, um, on the Romney Marsh, and with rails fastened directly to timber sleepers, track circuits were not very reliable. So we have, we put in many years ago now, uh, axle counting with wheel detection sensors uh, in, on the approaches to the crossings. And because our railway is not track circuited, but it does have wheel detection for all the vital bits of infrastructure. And they, they are not uh, uh, heavy industry standard. They are industrial uh, proximity de de detectors mounted on a housing that we have designed to ensure that it works with our particular system uh, of rail vehicles. Um, and that's been a significant saving and also a huge improvement in reliability because you, it's really becomes, the risk level rises if a level crossing doesn't, doesn't work reliably and people get to believe that it's not doing the job that it should. We've also put non-standard barriers. These barriers are made by a company called Pinch. Um, they are as it says on bullet points, simple, very well engineered electromechanicals with a very small footprint because we don't want to be digging big holes in the marsh. Uh, they're widely, widely used in, in Europe and they are a much smaller cost than the barriers that are normally used on the national railway from the national rail system. So the equipment is, we have remote monitoring on all of the equipment to ensure that we know the status of the, uh, of the railway. And if uh, there's a fault, then it, it dials up through the, the modem um, and sends a text message both to the duty controller and to the technical team to say that the, 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 the system is out of correspondence. And we can do an amount of interrogation of the system remotely to find out what the problem is before we go out to it. Um, so 
we have uh, we have a really good system for that but that talks about public road crossings and that's only 13 of them uh, what about farm crossings well we I think it's fair to say like a lot of railways had an understanding that farm crossings are difficult to control uh, however when you have an incident like that which happened in 2016 um, when I just joined the board it makes you think again in this particular instance a tractor driver you can see the tractor in the background with his load of hay bales uh, didn't really understand the crossing very well and approached it then realized the train was coming and couldn't reverse and the train struck the front of the tractor uh, in this occasion the driver wasn't hurt just a little shaken um, because as well as improving our crossing safety post the accident in the early 2000s we've also changed the layout and nature of the driver space to give the driver and we've changed our operating instructions uh, so the drivers are very clear what they should do if they if a collision becomes inevitable so we've got 28 of these what were we going to do about it well the solution in this case um, has worked really well and is low cost and fairly low tech what we now have and you can see on the right hand of the picture every farm crossing has a, a bent arm on it uh, with a number on a day glow hexagon and if the crossing is closed the driver can't see the hexagon and if the crossing is open the driver can see it so uh, a he can see if he's enough, enough distance to be able to take appropriate action to be careful and cautious and he can also uh, ring up to make sure that uh, he advises people that crossing in this case number 26 needs to be closed uh, and we can caution trains over until such time as that's been rectified it also simplifies discussions because you know exactly which crossing it is because when you've got 28 of them you can't say or saying it, it's the one just down by somewhere isn't really very helpful you need to have a very precise location so that's how we've uh, learned in some cases very sadly from experience now it's time to move on to the railway today and I want to talk firstly about a question of scale because this is relatively small scale railway um, the track gauge is 384 millimeters or 15 and 1 8 inches um, and our locomotives travel at 20 miles an hour um, so you would say well how does that compare to uh, to the rest of the world well the full size equivalent of our trains is we haul some big trains they're the equivalent of 500 tons at 60 miles an hour on a track gauge of three foot nine and a half 1152 about 80 percent of uh, the mainline standard so these are pretty big things um, traveling at a not inconsiderable speed and we, it, is a, it is a very serious railway and um, it's not um, it's not an amusement park ride um, it's a full size it's a may not be full size but it's a full intent railway and requires a full intent um, of proper safety systems and engineering to support it so let's start though with what most people come to see we are very proud on the railway of our mechanical engineering skills and we maintain our fleet of original locomotives um, so it's what most of our customers come to see they want to ride and they want to see a nice shiny engine and it's really important that we maintain them uh, to a good standard so these are the first two there's a Vrovsky purchase uh, numbers one and two uh, still in service and you can see in the top picture um, one of our special events where we have a bus rally that brings all sorts of enthusiasts out which is very good for custom we then come to the locos that were built in that second batch so what we would call the Greenly Pacifics so they are broadly speaking the same as the first two and they were three of the five that were being built in uh, David Paxman's works when you first saw it the other two are called the Greenlee Mountain class so they are uh, 482 locos and they were designed for uh, the freight traffic uh, which never actually materialized uh, but they are good solid workhorses because they were designed for the freight traffic and because that freight traffic didn't appear and because they made a there was a problem with system design when the railway was built uh, they didn't work for very long what was the problem well the 
original crossings on the railway were at a standard of one in eight, and these locos were too stiff along their wheelbase and couldn't negotiate them, were very prone to derailment. So they were not well favoured. Um, the railway, railway has been improved then. That was a very early example of how um, you need to think about system design when you're, when you're uh, building or improving something. So that's for the original Greeny locos. However, uh, Captain Howie also had a really great liking for the Canadian Pacific Railway, and he wanted a couple of locomotives that looked like Canadian Pacific locos. So um, shortly after the uh, initial purchase, then he, uh, he purchased a further two, um, which duly arrived in 1931. Their path to arriving on the railway uh, would form a presentation all of itself for those who were interested in it. Um, but let's say they, they took a, a curious route from design and concept to actual delivery, uh, but they've uh, been very, very strong, very powerful since. Now, some of you uh, may have uh, noted that the numbering isn't quite right and that number four is missing. But if I take you back to the original site of the building of the railway, uh, if you recall the works construction site, works construction loco, you can see on its buffer beam it carries number four. And that was because when Howie ordered two additional locos uh, once the light railway order was in prospect, one of those was works loco, which came from, from Germany. Um, and so there it was on site in 1926. However, like most construction equipment, once the railway was built, nobody frankly was very interested in it. It was sold off and finally ended up in a scrapyard in Belfast in 1969. Um, however, it, Sir William McAlpine uh, was concerned that we didn't have um, the full set of the original locos and he worked out where it was and arranged, and arranged to acquire it. And it's now back with us, it has been for some while, uh, called the bug. Nobody's quite sure why, um, but a, a fairly strong belief is that having fought in the First World War, uh, Captain Howie wasn't really very keen on things German, so he had what he considered to be a, a less than positive name uh, for this very good little loco. Uh, and that's the end of the original locos. The only other steam loco that we have is number 11, and that's designed by the same designer, Roland Martins, who designed the bug. And he and Henry Greenlee were great friends and cooperated a great deal. And when the opportunity in the 1970s arose to purchase this loco, we had we uh, picked that one up. So I want to talk now about how we maintain these locos. Here we have uh, number six coming in. We maintain, we do a major maintenance every 10 years. That ties in with the boiler certification and we are capable of doing all the work ourselves um, in order to get them back um, into, into ticket and we, we dealt with. So the first task um, is to slip it down, is to strip, strip it down. So here the boiler has been taken off and the smoke box is being taken off the front of the boiler. Uh, we don't do our own boiler work, that's contracted out. It's a very specialist skill. Um, and once we once we have stripped that, we start rebuilding the loco. We have a fully equipped CNC workshop, and we machine the parts uh, that need replacing. And a lot of them do. I mean, these locos do a lot of miles in their 10 years, and they are old-fashioned machinery. I mean, the technology is over 100 years old, and things wear. And going back to that first slide on questions of scale, they are put through some pretty hard duty. So we do find that a lot of the, the smaller parts actually need replacing every time they come in uh, because they, they do a hard job of work while they're out. But we have a very, very skilled team that are able to deliver that and they take a huge pride in their work. Uh, the first thing uh, that we do when we've got it uh, back and cleaned up a bit is we set up the motion. Uh, this is the part of the engineering where we have to make sure that everything works correctly, the steam system that delivers the steam to the pistons actually makes the loco go forward uh, and backwards in a consistent and well-measured man well manner. And this is also with measuring it up and making sure it's all correct. And having got it correct, you can see now here, the loco with the motion reassembled and the cylinders back on, and the large hose on the top of the cylinders provides it with air. So we run them on air to make sure they're broadly correct 
before they are taken out onto, uh, before they, they have the rest of the boiler put on and the bogies and all the cladding, uh, because we want to be confident that it will work when we put it back on the track. There are some technical matters that you have to deal with, because there are differences, between, differences quite significant ones in some cases, between running on, running on air and running on steam, but that's not for this presentation. So once the motion is reassembled, we can put the boiler back on. Um, we have a very, my team, our team has a very high attention to detail. Here, uh, they're putting the gold leaf lettering on the side of the tender, because what the loco looks like is very important to our customers. And there is number six ready uh, to be reunited with her tender and go out for return to service after checking, proving, and adjustment. Um, so they do a fantastic job, and the quality of the engineering within that is, is a, of a tremendous standard. So let's move on to signaling now. Signaling and control. How do we control the railway? Uh, in different ways, depending on where you are. So from Hyde to New Romney, it's telephone block. Uh, that means that we're able to run in either direction on either line. And we take great advantage of this uh, when we're doing special events, because we can run two trains side by side all the way from Hyde to New Romney. Uh, and that always attracts a lot of customers. Far side of New Romney, as we go towards Dungeness, then it's, there are single line sections. So it's a tablet between New Romney and Romney Sands, and a divisible staff between Romney Sands and Dungeness. Um, we have system-wide radio, so we can talk, the signaller can talk to the drivers, the drivers can talk to the signaller, the signaller can, and the controller, so that that gives us an extra level of assurance all the way. We have a driver's vigilance device. Um, that's mounted on the loco. It's actuated from the track, and you can see the picture below. I'll explain the actuation first, and then what, why we have it. You'll see a long rail and a short rail. They are universe, un unit directional. So if the train goes, detects the long rail first and then the short rail, then the driver's vigilance device uh, will sound in the cab and it needs to be cancelled. Uh, if it goes the other way and it sees the short rail first, then it immobilizes the system for a number of seconds so that it doesn't see the long rail. They are used at key uh, points where we need to be absolutely sure that the driver uh, is well. Why is that the case? Well, two reasons. Firstly, our trains are one-person operators, or well, the one person in the cab. So they are both driver and fireman. So if they were taken ill, if they were distracted, there's nobody to remind the other, uh, you know, nobody to remind the driver that he needs to be doing something. And secondly, the train can be uh, driver-only operated with no guard. And the driver's vigilance device is also connected to the passenger communication system so that in case of an emergency, the passengers cannot alert the driver. How it works, because of course these are steam engines, so we've got to think about how that works, is within the tender, there are batteries that uh, control, the, the, the control the device and make the sounds. And if it isn't acknowledged promptly, then there's a two-stage brake application through electrically driven valves from the tender. So um, it has to be capable. You have to bear in mind that with a railway whose primary mode of Motion is steam, that the things that you would perhaps take assume for uh, normal railway operation uh, have to be managed in a different way. So that's the signaling control pr principles. And our signaling equipment is of varying types given the varying ages of the, the railway. But here we see high signal box, which still has its original lever frame. But that drives some traditional um, 74 signals uh, and also some um, shunting signals that are electrically driven. So therefore, uh, there's, a, there's a good variety of things. In New Romney, we also have mechanical points. We also have electro-pneumatic pneumatic points, uh, some for signals, color light signals. Uh, so our signaling team is very well versed in um, making sure that it is proper, done all according to current and correct signaling principles, but um, with a variety of equipment, but appropriate to our railway. So, because this is a PWI, I thought I'd leave the track till last. So, let's talk about track. Now, track specification, there we go. Jointed track throughout. Uh, but the rail is actually quite long, at 40 feet, bearing in mind we're sort of third scale to quarter scale. 
So the equivalent of 100 120 feet, uh, 40 meter, uh, 40 meter rails. Um, so that's that's our that's the basic construction of it. Uh, our sleepers at 18 per length. Uh, we now have granite ballast. It was ballasted with the local shingle because that was a custom and practice in 1926. In fact, the Southern Railway had ballast had the shingle for its ballast. And the fastenings are just four dog spikes per sleeper, or very original. So what does that what does that mean for us in terms of how we manage it? Well, we've got some challenges. I suppose the first of which is nothing that fits on the big railway will fit on ours. So we've got to devise our own systems for doing things. We have uh, the ability to check our rail temperature and the air temperature at three key locations. That's really important because, as I said before, it's jointed track. So as you will have critical rail temperatures on other rail networks, we also need to know when the rail temperature is rising and when we might need to uh, caution traffic, when we might need to ask drivers to keep an eye open for uh, any disturbance. Uh, and so we do that very, very, uh, very, very um, assiduously, especially out on the marsh. Your, if the wind isn't blowing, it gets pretty warm. Uh, we don't have a track measuring train, uh, so we use ride quality as a proxy for track geometry. So um, that proves, helps to locate where the problems are, because if you only have driver reports, they're not very accurate at remembering exactly where it was they thought they had the problem. So we have got a good system whereby we can analyze that, we can compare runs uh, between one run and the next and decide how. Uh, whether the track is stable, whether it's deteriorating. And our track walks, our patrolling, is, is risk-based. So the frequency of the track walks reflect the frequency of the train service. Uh, we run a lot of trains in the summer. We're not running, we're only running at weekends now. So the need to check the railway um, varies uh, with the, the service we're actually running. And maintaining the track itself, well, it's jointed track. So the number one issue has got to be rail creep. Has been for years and still is. Um, the, uh, we're actively investigating different ways of fastening the track, uh, fastening the rail to the sleepers, because it's not a problem we want to see carrying on into the, into the future. Um, we have relatively few problems, but nevertheless, we, our view is that we shouldn't have any. Um, packing the shingle, the original shingle and ash ballast is a tricky thing. Um, it's a curious thing. We, we ballast with, with granite now, but there are still chunks of the railway ballasted in the original fashion. And the shingle and ash, once it is compacted, actually rides pretty well, but it's not easy to adjust it. So uh, we have a management problem. And you can see there on the picture, not so much the, the fact they're cleaning out the patchwork on the level crossing, but the fact that it goes straight from a level crossing um, with, which is a solid concrete onto ballasted track with no transition uh, gives us some challenges at support conditions. Um, so uh, that's, that's an area where we have to spend a great deal of time and thought uh, keeping on top of it. We also do track relaying. And here we're just going to walk through a few slides on how we do it. So job number one on the left-hand side is we break the track so we can separate the joint. We can, Take the uh, plates off and lift out the, um, uh, the, the joint. And then, you see on the right-hand side, we just take it out component by component. The rail is always scrap, um, so that can be burnt and carried away. Uh, and the sleepers are loaded to train. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, the most important thing of the um, picture, feature of the picture there isn't actually the rail, uh, the, the, the Alistair Dout Railway. It's the people you can see. Now, I know they're in the distance, but we have a truly uh, multifunctional workforce. At least half of those people standing there drive trains in the summer. And that's an important feature of our railway, that although people do have their functional specialisms and, specialisms and particular jobs, it is the sort of railway where when a job needs doing, people will go and lend a hand. Uh, and we don't run any trains in the winter. So uh, part of a driver's job is to be part of the track relaying gang in the winter. And that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, and it's amazing how, because they're involved in laying it um, and then driving over it, uh, 
they they have a clear understanding of the the need to get it right uh, and lay it to good standard. You can see on the right hand side a work train approaching when we've stripped out the railway, and then yes, we can dig out with mechanical equipment, but all the spoil has to go out by dumper because we don't have a fleet of spoil wagons, um, but we do dig out, as you can see on the right hand side, to a good, reasonably consistent level, uh, which we do with uh, laser levels and the design scheme to make sure that the formation is taken out to a good, uh, a good profile. And then on this left hand picture, it's not the track on the right hand side you're looking at, it's a gap on the left. Where having dug out the profile, we also compact the formation before we bring the ballast in, and then we will form, ballast comes in by train uh, because we don't want to be riding over the track that we've over the formation that we've just laid. So we'll bring it onto the adjacent road and then load it, load it carefully out onto the clear formation, and then lay and level the uh, the ballast to get us to the uh, the correct finish level uh, for the bottom of the sleeper. Sleepers come in by train, as you can see on the right. And then we do some final packing and adjusting um, with laser level and taking it up to the final design scheme once the work is complete. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a really good bit of final check and adjustment, uh, good for 20 years and 20 miles an hour. And that's exactly the specification that we need. So, in conclusion, Although the gauge is small, it is a proud and professional railway. We do things to a very good standard um, and are keen always to improve what we do uh, because essentially it's a scale speed of 60 miles an hour. It is a mainline railway and it's maintained to mainline standards. However, in an engineering presentation, you can't really talk about and haven't had time to talk about the, the it, how it fits with our local community in Kent. Uh, it relies on the support of and is supported by the local community. It's a really important local business, um, and we need to work well with the local councils and the local uh, business organisations so that we all work together to bring people to that area of Kent. It is, and I have taken the word carefully, it's an outstanding leisure and tourism business. That's what it is. It happens to run a railway, but it's a leisure and tourism business, and we only do well by delighting our customers and providing them with memorable experiences and a really fun day out. And in that, our people are absolutely key, whether they be train drivers, station staff, even permanent way staff, anybody in the business, if you meet a customer, you smile and you're nice to them and you make sure they have a really great day. Um, because they are a marvelous team of people. Um, that's the most important thing. The railway would be nothing without the team that supports it. Um, and on that final note, uh, if any of you were ever interested in giving a little bit of help, don't have to be going, I'm not suggesting digging ballast, but we're always interested in those who would like to lend their brains and skills to help us move along because we have about 40 permanent staff and a whole army of volunteers who contribute in different ways to keep the, keeping the railway um, going and to making it prosper because we have a we're approaching our 100th anniversary in 2027 and are determined to have a, uh, a really good celebration. So the, the, the team will always welcome anyone who would like to have an input in, area, in any area or even come and learn some things about an integrated railway um, because that's quite difficult to do now. Um, the rail, rail industry is so large and so diverse, it's quite possible to have uh, fairly narrow experience of a whole railway and we do run a whole railway so with that i'll take over to questions thank you well thank you very much David. that was uh, a fantastic presentation and i know i speak to on behalf of a number of our members who actually have connections with the marsh uh, jordan and howard i'm sure they found that equally uh, interesting as uh, as i did so 